everybody. We're going to go on here. Um, in compliance with the open public meeting law, I wish to state that on August 19th, 2022, the notices meeting of the Upper Township Committee was posted on the official Township Bulletin Board. The Upper Township website mailed to the Cape May County Gazette, the Atlantic City Press, the Ocean City Sentinel Ledger, the Herald Times, and filed with the municipal clerk. Tonight's meeting is being video recorded up to and until the closed session portion of this meeting and will be available on the Upper Township website. I hereby direct this announcement be made part of the minutes of this meeting. Would everyone please stand for the flag salute? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God and God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Barbara, would you please call the roll? Here. 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 Present. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the minutes of the August 8th regular and closed session minutes. Second. Please call the roll. Yes. 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 Okay, uh, where am I start? John, do you have anything for us tonight? Uh, one thing I'd like to make, take notice of, and I, I, say this, I say the same thing every year at this time. We're starting to see a lot of activities at our recreation facilities right now. We're starting to see a lot of the youth of the township travel back and forth on their bicycles. Darkness is falling much earlier. I would urge the parents to go out and buy their children an inexpensive light to put on their bicycles. It's very difficult to see, especially when the kids are wearing dark clothes. Many of our teams wear dark clothes as part of their uniforms. So as a safety concern, uh, I would just uh, once again request that parents begin to see that their children on bicycles are wearing something either reflective or that is uh, electrically lit. That's all I have. Thank you, John. Kim, do you have anything? I have a few things, yes. Okay, so first, there's been a lot of happenings going on with our football association as they get ready to kick off their season. Um, this past week, they accepted the and installed their new scoreboard, which is actually beautiful. It's twice the size of the old one. It doesn't flash. All the numbers work. It's really, really a sight to behold. Um, that scoreboard was donated so to, solely through businesses in the township, so we, we would like to thank uh, Eric Reich of Rice Asset Management, Action Supply, and also Sturdy Savings for donating the funds to be able to purchase that scoreboard. Um, and we would like to uh, also thank J.J. Claybauer, Kevin Mitchell, and Greg Borky for donating their time and professional skills to help install it so that it was at you know, no cost to the taxpayers, which was really phenomenal. Um, they also had two scrimmages this week. The one they had on Saturday was sort of a kickoff. It was a first annual where they hosted a team from Media Pennsylvania, which I thought was really unique for us to be, you know, sort of interacting with some of the tourists and summer homeowners that are in our area. It was a great day. Myself, Committeeman Pankos, Deputy Mayor Newman all had a chance to visit and um, be able to celebrate with, with the teams there. Um, they did also have a scrimmage on Wednesday um, that had some issues to sort of piggyback off of Mr. Coggins' statements. Um, we have been seeing increases in vandalism and things like that throughout all of our facilities since I would say about March. Um, this past Wednesday, there was a group of unruly teenagers, I guess we could call them. Um, it's important to say that they were not part of either sports team, they were not part of the program, they were simply there to observe. They were unable to be redirected by the adults that were there. Um, they were disrespectful. They had, there were several safety concerns throughout that, some of it having to do with bicycles and wheelies in crowded areas where small children were almost injured. Uh, myself, the recreation leader, and our administrator, Mr. DeMarzo, were able to work with the state troopers so that they had a presence there on Saturday. Behavior began again, and they were able to nip it in the bud with a very calm conversation with, with the kids. And they were able to move to a safer area and still be able to enjoy the day, and it was a much nicer day for everyone. So we're working together to figure out a plan for mostly the varsity games, because it looks like that's sort of their age group. That's when they're coming out. Uh, but I would just encourage parents, just please talk to your kids about respecting property. I mean, like I said, we're, we're seeing this widespread throughout the township. Um, our recre recreation leader and I 
met last week and again this week we've started to reach out to some community organizations to see what kind of funding is available for some youth programs um, very obviously these are not kids that are just that are not involved in the sports organizations that are taking up their time and that they don't have anything to do sports aren't for every kid and we need to be providing something for those kids that aren't the athletes and are not interested in that and have other interests um, I additionally have um, some updates on our Oktoberfest. Again, that will be October 9th, it's a Sunday. Uh, Ludlum Brewery has put in an application with the ABC and also with the county to be able to host a beer garden there that day. Um, there is one question on the permit application that pertains to it being uh, on facility operated by the government. So in conversations with the clerk's office, Mr. Rees, Mr. DeMarzo, um, I would like to make a motion that we authorize this particular permit on our site for that day, pending the ordinance that will be have a public hearing and final adoption later this evening. Well, I'll second that motion for discussion. Okay. Just for the record, I'd say I'm probably going to vote no. Um, we have a lot of township facilities. Alcohol is legal. I'm not opposed to drinking alcohol, but so is marijuana. So is other things. Um, at what point do we take a, a family event and turn it into something that maybe is not what we want? And if we allow alcohol, at what point the you know, next thing is going to be for it? And we're going to have an application somebody wants to set up a hookah bar or something. So I, I'm, you know, I, I understand I've your thought concerns. about it, and it's a, you know, it's a, all our parks, beaches, or alcohol, smoke free, and, and everything else. And I think I understand. The importance of it but we i also understand we just like you said we have to keep kids out of trouble and all but this might be an event a fam, fun family day event why do we have to have alcohol i can understand your concerns there are several municipalities throughout the county and throughout the state that host events in these fashion with adult um, areas yes. they are meant for all residents not just people with children so you know there, there is a has been a public outcry asking for something like this that's directed towards adults also but, it, but thank you I appreciate your comments we can all you know to counter that and, and there, there there is a permit process in oh, place right. for this and, and it comes from the state of New Jersey and it allows us to to if the ordinance passes as well allows us to have something like this um, I think we deal with the hookah bar when it comes up uh, uh, there's other or you know that that could that could, um, you know, uh, I mean, we've had problems. One day operation. We've had problems before, and people might drink it at home or beforehand. And I mean, we've had problems at our sporting events before. We had years ago. We had to. Uh, you'll probably remember we had a, a parent. We had to ban from Cobble Park. So he couldn't watch his kid because he couldn't come there sober. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to note that the permit application also includes like a footprint and security provided and those types of things. So it's not like a free for all where people are just roaming throughout the park. Well, I wasn't. No, I just went for the public ratification just, yes. just so that they're aware of, of the circumstances. Yeah, around. There's also places all over the county and the state to do this as well. Yes. Like, well, for example, the Wildwood Fireman's Parade is coming up <laughs> and they do on public property down there. I've, right? I've, I've been to plenty of events where alcohol was served and I've partaken myself. I just I think it's we fund the Mac situation and all that we do a lot of educational work to and I just think it's uh, just it's just me and if it's and if we run into problems then we don't then we have to do it yes. again <laughs> and again this particular is just like uh, Deputy Mayor Newman said it's just a step in the process I know this does not authorize it but it opens it up to what the board is doing here. Is, yeah, is we have to change the ordinance to permit it. And, uh, and I just think we're going to open it to us down a slippery slope. Foot. So that's just my opinion. Okay. So. Yes, please call the board. No. Yes. 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 Well, no, for reasons I stated earlier. Anything else, Kim? Uh, I believe that that is all I have. I have a few things on new business, but I'll save it till we get to that. Yeah. Uh, Mark, do you have anything for us? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have two things. Uh, our code enforcement's been busy again the past two weeks. Uh, Mr. Sure. Kazmarski has been out there uh, handling a lot of the issues, um, a lot of the, couple, you know, the, the local no neighborhood right. issues that arise during the two weeks. Um, and the second thing I have here, um, I, I spoke with um, our business administrator and I wanted to try to do something 
to recognize our employees. Uh, this was geared towards public works at first, but then it's kind of snowballed to the point where um, I want to bring it to, to everybody's attention here on the board. Um, we used to have an, I guess we used to have a, a, an employee newsletter that was back in 1995. I think this is the last one I have here. Um, and I'd like to, to revamp that a little bit um, to kind of showcase some of our employees of the month um, with, with the spotlight, employee spotlight of the month is what I'm, is what I'm looking to do here. Um, we have a lot of great employees, I think, not just in public works, obviously, throughout the township, we have a lot of great employees. And I think um, giving us a way to spotlight you know, them each month, I think, is, is a great service to not only them, but also for the community to see the good work that these um, employees are doing. Uh, we might want to add a column in there uh, for volunteers, too. We have a lot of volunteers in our community. Yeah, like I said, I wanted to bring yeah. this to the board's attention because I think that across the, across the board, uh, not this board, but across our, our employee base and volunteer base, I think um, this is something that um, would be beneficial to them. Um, I know Janet McBride, she does a great job um, on the wellness uh, aspect of things, and uh, hopefully she'll help us to expand this. Um, with your approval. My, my goal is to have one, one per month, have an employee spotlight per month, um, and then at, at, in December at our Christmas party, um, either do a drawing or have, have an employee picked. Um, and just like we did with the, the blood drive, we would, we would compensate them for an eight-hour day. We do that now, too, with the, um, through our GIF program. When they have a safety recommendation, you know, I think it, it is a safety committee that reviews it in every quarter, I think that is, isn't it? So. Well, I think that's a great idea. And then an employee of the year um, is announced at the organization, and that employee gets under Yeah, we do it through the safety committee, right? Yeah. I think that's a great idea. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I need to do anything else with it or not. No, you need to throw it back a million. <laughs> okay. <laughs> make it work. And make it work. Make, make it work. work. Uh, I do have some new business, but we can handle that when we get to get down there. I think that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Jay, do you have anything first? Yeah, I, I, a couple things that will occur, uh, there are actually agenda items that I'll have a lot to say about um, on the unfinished business portion of it on number 19 and number 20, um, as I always do. But uh, I just want to highlight a couple things that happened over the weekend and talk with Chief Coker about it just before the meeting. Um, we had two brief periods <laughs> over the weekend. Normally we get all kinds of calls ranging from, what, you know, bloody nose to super <laughs> you know, cardiac arrest or mass casualty incidents. We had this strange occurrence twice in a five hour period in which we had one time we had three calls within 15 minutes, okay? And the other time we had four calls within a 20 minute period probably, even less than that. All EMS calls, all were transported to the hospital. The point of the whole conversation and bringing it up is that the system worked that we've worked on and built over the years to make something like this if it happens it happens the dispatchers did a fantastic job of g going through it as actually two different sets of dispatchers and two different crews that were on the uh, ambulances uh, that day and the fire companies were dispatched as per policy and uh, the they, they came out in fact one of the calls two of the calls were within 50 feet of each other, I would say, 100 feet of each other in the same neighborhood. So you're like, wow, this is, what's going on? That was luck. <laughs> yeah, that, well, I don't know if it was luck, but you still have to have an ambulance for each one of them. You know, it doesn't, you know, they were unrelated. And uh, we had to call other, we only have two ambulances or three ambulances at the time. We had to call outside ambulance from Ocean City, which we've done on multiple occasions, and they were able to come over and help us out. So it worked. That was the whole point of the conversation. Other than that, uh, like I said, I'll have, I have a couple of things to report on with regard to um, items uh, 19 and 20 uh, that I'll have coming up in unfinished business, I think it is. Okay. Um, yeah, a couple of things I want to, a couple of my notes we're going to hit in, on, or uh, new business too. Um, but the 13th of uh, August, Gary and I met with the SIA over for their general meeting, and that went fairly well. I think uh, we got a little beat up over there, but it, it was a good meeting. I heard a lot of people's concerns. We got a left fair with a punch list of things that needed to be tightened up, but uh, 
it was all it was a very good meeting, well attended meeting. What was there? Probably seventy five people there, guys. It was a big meeting. Yeah, it was surprising. Uh, it lasted about three and a half hours. We took we fielded a lot of questions, answered a lot of questions, and uh, actually we had enough notes and stuff with us. We don't we didn't leave there with too much homework, but uh, the north and then uh, Sunday I got a phone picture there about the north end of this. Corson's Inlet State Park, where we, our dune fence had been around there, and the split rail fence had washed up. The kids had piled it up and built some kind of fort and all that. And now that the piping plovers are going, Public Works actually got out there this morning and got that all cleaned up, and they did a fantastic job. And somebody had taken a trash can out with there, which was a good thing. They rolled one of our trash cans with wheels out there, so. Whoever was building the fort out of all the sticks, which was actually utilizing the trash can, made clean up a lot easier. So that was a, <laughs> that was a good thing. So uh, that's all I have at this time. So Gary, move on. Gary, do you have anything for us? Uh, I just want to shout out to um, Civil, uh, Seville Tavern. Uh, the mayor and I had a shared service uh, lunch in there. Uh, it, it was very productive, yes. and the food was delicious. Always a good meal at the, at the Seville. Um, the uh, segways came to a, I guess, a complete stop, so yeah, to speak. Right? Right. So yeah. we want to uh, thank Lieutenant Rocap and his uh, troopers. Um, they were instrumental in identifying one of them. Um, a second individual uh, got off the Segway and ran into the woods. Um, so unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, they left, the, uh, they left the, uh, the business cards and we were able to identify at least the individuals. We were, we were not able to uh, elevate it to the company. We weren't able to, to verify the legitimacy of the company. Well, Gary's being a little humble. He actually started, he got the phone call about 6 in the evening, and I think he was on the job till almost 11 that night. So uh, he never made it home. So he actually chased it down, police involvement, and it was a, Gary did a fantastic job yeah. following through on that. Thank you. And that was from um, the, the PSAs that we've been putting out to the public uh, for us to, to call. And that's exactly what it is. So we've been working, uh, the mayor and I and, uh, and Commissioner, uh, Committee Woman Kim, uh, Kim Hayes, have been working very close with the state police. And we've been developing a, a closer relationship. And uh, I believe the name, you had the names, it was uh, yeah. Scott Varga. Yeah, Steinhauer, Scott, Trooper Steinhauer, Trooper Scott, and Trooper Varga. Um, we're instrumental in being professional, number one, very professional, number two, responsive to our requests, and just, just uh, understanding the, the gravity of the situation and taking charge. And, you know, somebody actually gave foot chase, which doesn't happen at all anymore. But that, I guess that guy's still in the woods somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> he, never, he never came out. I did receive a call the, the next day as they were taunting, uh, taunting us that they were still in the woods and, and they're willing to come back out. Well, but uh, it's important. It's important that we utilize the state police. It's important that we use the process, and uh, and they are very aware of, of the case and, and what uh, what was involved in that. Um, and then subsequently, uh, we got another phone call for uh, someone selling electric services in the uh, uh, Ocean Sands area down down that way. Uh, we were unable to locate that individual, but at least we got the phone calls. So it's it's important. It's very important. Um, the other the other conversation we had with the mayor and what came out of, of uh, the uh, Strathmore Improvement Association was was code enforcement, and um, you know it's echoed time and time again. And I can tell you that uh, between the deputy mayor and the mayor, they are um, looking to put together a program for next summer for code enforcement to start to really kind of define the unit and uh, define the to find the goals of that particular unit. So and that's going to be township-wide. It will not just be Strathmore. It'll be township-wide. We'll be able to utilize them for special events. We could probably utilize them crowd control, stuff like that at the Code football games. I mean, all yes. those property maintenance issues that Rich is, is running into um, can be encapsulated under that particular program. Yes. Uh, everything else like we put under new business to kind of discuss. And we can move on. Okay. Barbara, do you have anything for us? Nothing at this time. Thank All right. Dan. Nothing to report. Paul, do you have anything for us? Um, just want to report back to the committee that um, uh, 
Scott, for the last year, uh, our GIS uh, online viewer has not been active on the website due to some changes in the state law under the Daniels Law. Um, just wanted to let you know our GIS provider is able to kind of tweak the, that service and get that service back up for our uh, public who will use the GIS viewer, which allows people to look at the parcels and check to see the properties for wetlands, zoning, and other things. So that is back up and running. Almost fine tuning that uh, some of the tracking software that uh, I think Coach mentioned at the last meeting uh, about implementing that on the website. So as soon as we get public works involved in that, hopefully over the next month we'll be able to pull that program out. Paul, uh, not to uh, change the subject if you're done. I, I, I did, did uh, um, remember in Committee McCoggins and I were talking about it right before the meeting. Has, has that traffic study that we requested at, at the Parkway entrance in Roosevelt Boulevard been completed? Were you aware of that? I have not heard anything from the county engineer it, regarding that. I can follow up. With if that. we can follow up with that, and when that is done, regardless of the results, I would like to see a sit down with the county engineer on a one-on-one, -on -one, face to face meeting. I'll be there. I'm tired of the. The okay, well, the traffic study doesn't warrant it, or we don't want to be have too many people in the queue. Uh, you know, well, too bad. I mean, do you want to be in the queue for an extra light change, or do you want to be in the hospital for a couple of hours? You know, it's shift change, yeah, yeah until shift change. Um, uh, and, and you know, traffic studies and engineers are all great, you know, that, and I'm not down in your, your profession, but. Being out there is a totally different story out in the field. It doesn't trans, you know, it doesn't translate sometimes to, to real life. So if we could do that and then you know, have a face-to-face -face meeting, we might might uh, be better results. And in all honesty, I was telling the Commander Coggins as well that this is um, we, we have had less accidents this year, and that's an unofficial study. Um, and but we just have had less accidents. But there's more people getting around. As, John I was coming out of Ocean City the other day, and it was amazing the amount of people. I was proceeding straight, and there were the people that passed me on the right just flying. I mean, I, and if somebody would have turned in front of me, it, it was, yeah. It's going to happen, right? Uh, you see how it happens? Usually you drive a pretty big car, that's, you're going to win. Yeah. <laughs> that's all. I'm sorry, Paul. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's all I meant. Barbara, do you have anything? All right, we're going to jump on this agenda here. And I think we uh, need to, I, I'd like to make a motion we accept the reports listed one, two, three, and four, animal control, all the way there. Okay. Yes. Second. Please call the roll. Yes. 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 <clears throat> okay. No, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the consent agenda as posted. Second. Please call the roll. Yes. 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 It, uh, does anybody, my colleagues, have any comments at this point? Or? Well, what I'd like to ask is for uh, Mr. Reeves to give a general synopsis of this ordinance since it is the public hearing and uh, explain to the public exactly what is happening with this ordinance. Absolutely, Mr. Coggins. So the purpose, in a nutshell, of the ordinance is to authorize the township to permit uh, alcohol to be consumed on township property with township approval to be given on a case-by-case -case basis in compliance with state staff. So the state does permit excuse me, certain um, temporary liquor license permits be issued either to uh, various nonprofit entities or to breweries or to um, 
restaurants that have a liquor license on a catering permit basis. So you, uh, nonprofits get a social affairs permit and others get a catering permit. So uh, in order to obtain this permit, it does require that um, the owner of the premises authorize the permit, which in this case, of course, the township to have uh, these permits used on township property. Um, the township has to formally give itself that authority. And so I did prepare this statute uh, based on uh, some feedback I had from Mr. DeMarzo. And the, the way we established it is the statute in and of itself doesn't permit anything except to permit the committee to authorize events in the future. So those would be authorized by resolution uh, in the future. And in this case, we had a resolution tonight which was specifically conditioned upon passage of this ordinance. Uh, there's a brief note which came to my attention thanks to our clerk um, carefully reviewing uh, the lease agreement specifically for Amanda's Field, which is actually county open space preserved property subject to a long-term lease to the township. Um, basically, pursuant to that lease, the township has full control and authority over uh, Amanda's Field, uh, full responsibility for all maintenance, use, etc and has authority to regulate uh, and create law relating to the use of the man's field. Subject, however, to the approval uh, with regard to any legislative, you know, legislative action uh, of the uh, county commission, uh, board of commissioners. So, with that said, if this ordinance were to pass tonight, it would still be subject to approval. And the specific language of the lease says, which approval shall not be unreasonably withheld. So just to be clear, this is a process that's already authorized by state law, subject to also being authorized uh, by the committee, and in the specific case of the managed field, subject to authorization by the county. Thank uh, you. Are there any questions for me specifically about the orders? Any other, my colleagues have any comments? At this time, we'll open it up to the public for comments regarding ordinance number 19 of 2022. Does anyone have any comments? No. It was just a terrible accident. I didn't. I just wanted to make sure because I thought perception with alcohol kind of in this town would not be the best. From what I remember, it was just a terrible accident. It was, yeah. Is there any other public comment on this ordinance? Hearing no other public comment, I, uh, We'll close the public portion. Obviously, I'm not going to say my spiel again, but everybody knows how I feel, so. We'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we adopt ordinance number 19 of 2022. Second. Please call a roll. Mr. Collins? No. Ms. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Cantos? Yes. Mr. No. All right, moving right along. So each one of these, it, it's like what I did over the past two weeks, right? So, so the committee gives me certain things, and now I get to give, give it back to the committee for your kind of uh, explanation and explanation to the public. So one of the item 15, I've been working with uh, a committee woman, Hayes, and uh, the mayor, Corson, relative to some motorized ATV use in the candy, candy pit? pit? Candy's pit. So if you want to uh, explain or, or comment, uh, what, what we have there is a large parcel of land um, and the entrance to both parcels, right, Paul, is dead center in our property and Cedar Villas. And so they're entering our property, meaning municipality's property, and then cutting to the left 
and then going into Cedar Villages and then going behind Regal and, and dirt biking there. So that parcel, from what I understand and from what the mayor um, explained to me, is one of our natural areas and kind of falls under Committee Woman Hayes' purview as far as what we want to do with it, what it wants to look like. Um, of course, the fallback is always more signs. So you can put more signs up and say you've got no ATVs. Um, but, at the, but at the end of the day, I sent uh, the committee a series of photographs from my uh, exploration with Paul as to the intersections, where we can put some barricades, what we can, what we can name the park, and then kind of stop the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the ridership, the membership back that way. And uh, I spoke to Cedar Villas, and they were um, still working on their subdivision of, of their parcel, but they are willing to participate in anything that the township feels. Well, obviously that property was given to the township years ago, um, probably in the 70s, maybe the 80s. Um, obviously it's built up all around it and it was deed restricted, I believe, for recreation. And I think, did Dan, did they get you a copy of the deed to look at? I have not seen a copy of the deed that I recall. Yeah. I don't have a copy of the deed this evening. But, but I can certainly review that deed. But, Obviously, I'm not saying we want to develop it, but if, is is there something we can do if it's Steve restricted for recreation? Is there something we can do to maybe put it to do something to prevent the ATVs I, from going in there? Yeah, I think the I think the general idea is to keep it sort of one of the natural spaces, but restrict access to ATVs and mopeds. Um, it's you know it's a safety and liability mm -hmm. issue. It's the neighbors in the area are being disturbed. Their property is also being trespassed on. So. Um, I think I'm looking for just some feedback from my colleagues as to what they would like to see happen there. You know, I, the idea of putting up big guardrails or something like that sort of doesn't go with the natural aspect of the area. So what, how do we move forward and keep it safe but still keep it? It's you know. been an ongoing problem for years. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, we've been here before and I think Public Works years ago, we directed them to put a gate up and you told me the gate wasn't there. Well, it might have been put up and... It, I mean, there's an old cable that was put up by the township that that was... Well, we can't uh, put cables across. Yeah, we don't want to close line. Uh, well, one of the property owners, you know, informed us that they had put several large trees there only to find them cut up a few weeks later. So, I mean, they're, they're just whatever's there, they're removing so that some well, of them are going to have to patrol as well. A neighbor dumping their debris there is called illegal dumping, so it's... No, 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 <laughs> they, they, it was their private property. They had put oh. on, their, on their piece of property to try to block it. Yeah. To oh, okay. Yeah, on, to try and block it so they had no access and they just came through and cut up the trees. <laughs> He's been dead for 50 years, I believe. But he has a success. Oh, can he? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he had been not, uh, Mr. A had it for a while. Yeah. A, a, the, the earth, Earthworks had that pit and worked the pit for a while. And we put, then there was fly ash put in there from the. Yeah, that's that's the, on the Cedar Village side, not the country side. Yeah, Gandy's yeah. the one that actually gave us the, the land. The pit. Okay. Yeah. We're, we're, so, and he's been dead had, 60 yeah, years. So we have to do some research to identify who his legal successor is, but there is one. There is some ultimate successor to his interests who we could go to. And if not, we could probably still file an application with the court to have the deed restriction removed or modified in the absence of uh, identifying a successor despite our best efforts. And if that's the nuclear option, when Paul and I were there, there were people using it. Are running and there's mm -hmm. joggers getting the oh, it's, it's beautiful. Right, it's beautiful. So, yes, you yeah, know, I'm, maybe you make it look more like a park and maybe you just figure out some strategic but, points to. But here we are. Stuff. I mean, we have we have parks that we are maintaining now that are just. I understand. We man. have vandalism, we have problems. The park, the ride the yeah, it uh, perpetuates it. I mean, you have to take some sort of action to, yes. to, to, to notify. 
that well, it's right, given proper do, do action. We, right. Do we so have any, uh, I mean, this is obviously, do we have any, like a topo or any kind of thing that resembles a survey of this property? No. Okay, I'm just, that's. Well, after the first frost, I'd like to go out there and take a look around. I'm not going to. You don't, you don't, it's, it's, the fans are clear for. Oh yeah. Don't worry about the fixing. Mm -hmm. Well, I want zero fixing. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking when you chased into the segway. Wait, guys, I went to the woods. I said, God bless you, buddy. buddy. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna figure out what South Jersey's about. <laughs> Utah. They were all from Utah. <laughs> But that's uh, okay. So we need a little more information on the deed restriction, and then we can yeah. Work through and it again, some I'll, I'll forward some, uh, some additional uh, some additional uh, photographs for the intersections, and maybe if somebody wants to uh, to meet me out there. What's it about? Fifteen acres or so? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's just something that I I don't know what the complete answer is, but it's something that. I mean, we have a lot of recreation facilities now, and I I don't think we should clear it and build fields. Cause, I mean. Yes. So, barring, you know, they're always going to, you know, even on some of the internal roadways that, you know, that Gary's talking about, kind of maybe trying to control, there are always going to be a sidestep that can go down the railroad tracks to gain access. So well, the, unless we look, are looking at the wall. So well, the wall. Oh, <laughs> the, that's not this. The, 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 the railroad tracks are slowly becoming overgrown. I mean, we had somebody at our meeting, well, two meetings. Clear the railroad clear tracks, railroad right. track, so which, yeah, so that's, that but it's in just the same shape. The same. Paul, there's no section of our proposed bike path that's coming that intersects well, with this. Right, so that's something we have to consider too. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing is that the railroad bed was converted to a tra uh, bicycle track. Mm -hmm. What they do is they put in ballards and all to stop most. It's it, not ATVs, you can't stop motorcycles. Yes, the motorcycles are going to get through it because they're, you know they're the same width as a bicycle. Um, but how you, about at this point, uh, committee to authorize some no trespassing, no no ATV use. At least we'll put something up there to yeah, to, to protect us. To protect us that we do have an incident that we trespassed. You know, yeah, that's the first thing you got to do. Okay. Uh, the next item was a uh, the Atlantic City uh, sent over uh, helicopter operations, which caught, which caught my eye and which caught the eye of uh, Committeeman Pankos. So we started digging into that, and uh, Committeeman Pankos can. So back when I served on the uh, zoning board, this was approved was about, a, about a year and a half ago. Um, Atlantic Sea Electric is continuing their upgrades of their uh, energy grid, which includes uh, new towers being put uh, out in the marshlands be uh, between where the old uh, power plant used to be and out to, the, I think they call it a Tuckahoe Junction. Actually, it's going, they're going to do the power uh, line all the way down to 550. Course, yeah, yeah, yeah. But this particular part, I think, is what is what caught my attention was the fact that you know they have helicopters and it's been approved. This is basically just a PSA to the public that there's going to be a helicopter flying around Shaw's Curve. It's going to be stationed there. There's a helipad being put in right now. Um, they're transporting these large metal towers uh, across Tuckahoe Road and they'll be going out into the marshland. I know just. From back being on the zoning board, I, I raised the question of why can't they fly them from Ocean City or from Woodbine? Um, but it's a safety issue. They need the shortest route possible, which is right there. It'll fly over Tuckahoe Road, and then it'll go across the game preserve there, um, and then right out into the marshland where they'll, they'll install that. Yeah, they'll be flying them. These are ones by our old landfill. They'll be flying in mm -hmm. and visit the wetlands, probably mm -hmm. some even back uh, and I know Atlantic, behind my place there's some wetlands yeah, there where they got yeah. towers to build. Um, Atlantic Sea Electric, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're not very. What's okay. that? 
he did pulsated offline in there, which is right. Um, Lancaster Lecture has been been very open. Uh, they're they're sending out uh, 5,500 flyers to the community, uh, just letting them reinforcing this message and just saying, hey, look, there's going to be some operations going on for the next. Uh, what did they have on there? It was to be completed by. It's going to start in September and it'll be over by uh, May. May of yeah, next year. Basically, you miss Memorial Day to Labor Day. Yep. They're going to try to get it done over the winter. We'll That's all. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. This was a known thing. They sent out notifications yeah, over a year ago. And yeah. that's what it is. The monthly newsletter you kind of encapsulated mm -hmm. in your governor's uh, report. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we've gotten a bunch of phone calls about a post on Route 50, which is a, is a state highway. Yeah, so I had a, a few members of the public reach out to me about the possibility of sidewalks along Route 50. Um, obviously, to put sidewalks through the entirety of Route 50 would be a massive undertaking. So the, the finished proposal was that it would be from uh, pretty much like the business area, so basically like Tyler Road South, so along where like Custard Hut, Oasis, um, Action Supply, those kind of businesses where there's some neighborhoods off there. Um, for two reasons, first of all, it would support our businesses. Second of all, it's a safety concern. There are a number of people who walk down the shoulders of the road there. I know that there have been injuries to pedestrians and bicycle riders in the past. Um, so really, it's a, a state highway, so it's up to them to look into it. So I'm just looking for some support from my colleagues, if we could have a resolution um, to ask the state to take a look at Actually, it. Actually, what's uh, the one property between the Custard Hut and uh, that development there? I can't. Came, yes. That's, that came into the planning board years ago for something, didn't it? Not recently, but uh, the, the property owners looking to uh, put a Storage. Well, obviously, part of his application we, would be to put, mm -hmm. I mean, if we, we should mandate sidewalks here. Um, traditionally, Upper Township, when we do paving projects, we pay for the curb replacement and all that if it needs to be replaced. Technically, the curb replacement and sidewalk is the property owner's responsibility. Other municipalities, when they do work, and I, I believe we could probably put curb and sidewalk on the state highway if we wanted to in our township. But we'd have to have their permission, though, right? We'd, I mean, have, we'd to, have to have a we, conversation we, with the state. So I think that's really what I'm looking to do is what, open the conversation and see how we would move forward. Um, if the township, we have to be careful. If we were, if we started paying for sidewalks, I think it's going to well, everybody's going to want a sidewalk in front of their house. Well, and I, I think that's expense. like way down the line in the conversation. Yes. I think the public has reached out and asked us to investigate this and see the feasibility and, and look at the cost. And I think that's really it's just a first yes. step. Let's yeah. see if it's possible. You know, rather than just say no, let's take a look and see what I'm we not, can do. I'm not saying no. Yeah. One of our options is to actually, if we just deem it's necessary to put a sidewalk there. or we can assess the property owners. I think it would be a great way to, you know, improve safety in the area and also support those businesses there. So I'll put that in the form of a motion. Yeah, I'll second that. That we're that we will uh, have a resolution asking the state to take a look oh, at okay. the potential for sidewalks along Route 50. Yes. 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 All right. I'll draw, I'll draft something up. Get it to the clerk's office and maybe the members can sign. Thank you. Well, this again is the, I think I sent the committee a synopsis of where we were and all the questions that were born from the Segway problems that we were having. Um, uh, Dan and I have been battling with. Uh, the Anderson Window people, the Supreme Court. I mean, this is a this is a, a, a very interesting was a very interesting topic for me. Right now, that the municipality has a zero tolerance. Right, it's not allowed. It's not allowed. It's not allowed. And the Supreme Court said it is allowed. And so Dan's position and and and, and eventually my position because I acquiesced was we have to put together an ordinance relative to allowance, but the restrictions are in the ordinance. And, the, and the, this is all born from, from uh, one of the vendors that want to knock in the municipality. Um, one of the thoughts 
the, the, the ordinance, I believe, is, is, is relatively detailed now relative to the process. And so one of the things I put into the committee's uh, um, executive packet was the violations to make sure that they know we're serious and make sure that that violation doesn't go to the corporation, like when you sign a ticket against UPS, the driver doesn't care because it goes towards UPS, but it goes towards the individual. And that violation would be maxed out substantially, but per every knock. So it's not just the one violation. You knock on two doors, it's 2,000 bucks. You knock on three doors, it's 3,000 bucks. I think from what I've taken from my conversations with committee is your seriousness to protect the rights of your residents. Mayor Corson, you've been completely um, uh, transparent that you don't want people at your door. I don't think any of them. Any of them. Nobody. <laughs> especially with society today. You, somebody you, you get that knock at the door, especially like the Segway guys. They were going at 9 o'clock at night. I mean, that was ridiculous. I think they're a good example of why the, you know, the registry, like Mr. Coggin spoke about when we originally talked about this, is so important. You know, we had very difficult, very difficulty verifying that they were even legitimate. So, you know, how many people paid them money for services that they may never see? You know, if, if there's something in place where they have an identification issued by the township and every resident is aware of it, they can request that and know that that is a legitimate business and they should expect services. We have a, we have a very strong ordinance developed and, and now we're down to violations so in the ordinance we want to make sure it's detailed relative to the the cost of violating this particular ordinance. I, I particularly like the fact that you're violating the individual not the company mm -hmm. so um, and the fact that they have to you know and the fact that they have to actually have a permit to do it it's like Correct. anything else you have to ask permission to do it and then even then you know, the ordinance, as far as I understand it, is you're going to be able to opt out anyway as an individual citizen by placing a sign Correct. in the yard, which and I don't think we should have to do, but it's another thing that we have to do. One of, and one of the things that, that have come up in conversation is the stance from the municipality to provide that sign, right? So we're telling, we're telling any vendor that comes in, if they see a sign, and you know, maybe we have a maybe we have a sign sign up and see how how much uh, interest there is to get a sign. But if they see that sign, then that's a violation. But, but if the Supreme Court says, you know, under the guise of selling pesticides, I can go and just walk on your property. I mean, I, I think there's something. That I'm not a bit huge fan of signs, and I you shouldn't have to post your property no trespassing or not to, to keep people off of it the thing is you did we just well, did I, I i know and this thing is i understand the no solicitation signs and all that and the last thing we want to do is go through a neighborhood and every house have a, 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 a 18 by 24 no solicitation sign in the front yard it's going to look horrible and i don't know and it, you're right and does the township have to pay for these i don't you know if somebody wants a no solicitation sign we should probably try to get a vendor that's in the township. There's two or three hardware stores that can produce these signs or sell these signs. And there's sign shops. And maybe we can just have a link. I don't think the township should be providing signs at cost. Cause well, in this, in this day and age where um, electronic access is so readily available, can we not put something in the ordinance where the township maintains electronically a list of people who have requested no solicitation and make the solicitors, as they receive their license, aware of the fact that that is there. And if they trespass at any of these addresses, then they will be summarily fined. That's absolutely an option. And I've updated the draft ordinance, which has not been introduced yet, even since the last time we spoke. So what you may see in your packets for this evening is from last time, I actually updated further based on prior discussion that, um, yes, we would, and it's uh, not not my invention, but I was doing reading about it, as a do not not registry. And the way it works is essentially you opt into the registry, you fill out some very simple form or otherwise notify the township that you would like to be on this registry. Of course, it's by address, not by name. But it's like a do not call list. It, exactly. 
Bingo. Exact same concept. And um, I like that. It, it is a relatively recent development because, of course, door to door sales makes you think about bygone era, except, as Mr. Kynes pointed out, in the era when we are bombarded with electronic communication to the point that we ignore most of it, some companies have realized we actually get better interaction with our potential customers if we show up. And so that's it's sort of this new dawning of door-to-door salespeople. Uh, and it, it ain't the fuller brush man anymore. <laughs> right. is there, Dan, is, is there like, do residents have to like opt in annually? I know the do not call list. I think that's like every year or every so, few years you have to like re-up it. So it, this is totally a, 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 a township creation okay. in the sense of it's our own registry. Perfect. And I have not found any case law uh, that limits the, the participation in a do not knock registry. Again, it's a relatively new invention, but to me it makes sense because the whole point of this conversation is the township doesn't get to impose its will on the residents in the sense of determining who residents do and don't want to come to the house. And so by simply giving them the option either, and it's multiple step process, either put up a sign or be on the registry or both, yeah, okay. Um, you have a lot of different options. So if you want the best protection you can get, you put up a sign and you put up and you put your house on the registry. And then the registry, the way I've directed it currently, it would continue until one of two things happens. Either they call in again to say, please remove my property from the registry, or the property is set. Change ownership. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So when there's a change of ownership, and I did have this conversation with our tax collector who indicated that, yes, when there's a change of ownership, of course the township receives notice of the, the change for purposes of updating their tax records. And there's already a set of information that is sent out by the tax office at that time to the new owner. And so what she indicated was it would be relatively simple to put one more uh, public service announcement in that package that goes out to a new property owner indicating if you'd like to participate in our do not knock registry, here's how. Uh, so what I've been working on over the past few weeks since we last discussed this is how do we get as much protection as we can while also making it as administratively comfortable as we can? Because as we've talked about in other contexts, ultimately it's about enforcement. We do need to be able to enforce our law, which is what's probably going to change to begin with. Currently we have a law that if anyone challenges in court, will not hold up. But we are now making a law that should hold up and should be enforceable, and it uses the best um, options that are available under the, the First Amendment jurisprudence that is likely to be upheld by the courts. Uh, but also, we can't convert all of the township's resources to this specific issue. There's a lot of things going on, and so we need to make sure that we are administratively flexible, and uh, Gary had a lot of good suggestions in that context. So we are actually focusing on putting more of the burden on the applicant to do the work. So uh, sometimes I've learned that says, the applicant will apply, and then the town will run a background check. Good idea to have a criminal background check. But you know our local police are the state police, and when you want a criminal background check from the state police, you can go directly to the state police. So we have revised it to say, rather than coming here and starting the background check process, you are going directly to the state police, getting your background check results, and bringing them to us. So they, you said, here it is. And if it says no prior criminal history, approved, basically. If there is a criminal history, then we submit it to the Woodbine uh, station commander or his or her designee to review. And at that point, um, now we have the police input as far as should we be giving this person uh, a license or not. Um, there are some exceptions uh, by That's law, that, but again, this is court law. Basically, we have to provide an alternative to the background check process, which is a company that employs people who are applying for these licenses. Can submit a certification that the company has reviewed uh, uh, the employee's background check in the past 12 months and it indicates a clear criminal history. So essentially, then they're doing the work for us. So they're submitting that certification, so be it. Again, there's a double um, accountability here in the sense of the company must obtain a license and the employees must obtain a license. 
let me throw this in there, Dan. So what Dan and I are doing is we are developing the process. So the ordinance is great, but I have to administer it. Um, Ms. Young's office has to abide by it. So to put in the, the process now in the form, so you're familiar with the SBI numbers. So the form would almost look like a dog license form. And on that form would be four or five blocks that they would have to complete, one being an SBI number. And once your SBI number is in the system, that's it. And then you need your driver's license, and that would go on the form. And then you need an employee ID, and that would go on the form. And then they would need the vehicle identification, and that would go on the form. And that would be the form that the clerk's office would maintain, just like a dog license. So it would be very administratively sensitive to who has to maintain these lists and maintain these costs. So if they're coming in and paying 500 bucks for a license, that license would be this form. And then this particular form would have to be around the neck with a lanyard. And so this way, if anybody ever was questioned, that form would be immediately, whether it's carbon copied or whether it's a computer copy kept within the system. We're looking for an administratively sensitive process to now implement. And what Dan and I have been doing is just kind of stealing everybody else's good idea and kind of building our own ordinance. Well, I, I think that you always get these things on Facebook, you see these things on Facebook where there's a car in my neighborhood taking pictures or whatever. I think the vehicle should be clearly identified mm -hmm. with magnetics, front sides, backs, whatever. I mean, and it's just, I mean, that's the big thing. And like these segways, there's no way to identify by these things. I mean, so, um, the ordinance is drafted broadly enough to apply to all other vehicles in addition to automobiles, so segways are covered. And yes, we require that whatever cart or wagon or car or vehicle is used has to be clearly labeled with the name of the company as well as a statement that the company is licensed to provide order to door sales uh, in the township. And so that is uh, an obligation that is reasonable, but that realistically will be challenging to fulfill in certain regards. So if someone's driving around with a car, yes, absolutely, it should be on the side. I, I don't think we can say you can't have a Segway, but we can say you, your Segway has to be labeled in some apparent manner. It can't be that I have to come out with a magnifying lens and you know, try to read it that way. Visible at 10 feet. Right, absolutely. And I so, mean, it, well, <laughs> it has to be clearly labeled, and this is a context where we can say, we can use a, a quote, reasonable land standard where we can say, look, if I can't see it from my window, then I can't see it. Because if I'm trying to figure out if I should answer the door or not, I need to be able to look out and say, who is that? And if it says, it's Anderson Windows, okay, I know who Anderson Windows is. If it doesn't say, if it's an unmarked van, then you should call the police, right? I mean, why Why are they here? They're not following the rules. And so that's, those are the rules we're looking at preparing. Uh, so signage is key, you know, as Gary mentioned, badges. Again, that was a context where originally we were looking at badges that are prepared by the township. And then we realized from an administrative standpoint, why make it our job? We can put that on the actual applicants that once they're approved, they have to create their own badge that meets our requirements, our specifications. And we approve, yeah. Exactly. And so that's really what we've been working on over the past several weeks is, again, how we make this a, a, a robust, clearly enforceable ordinance that uh, also has that administrative flexibility, which, you know, the ordinance itself specifies certain things that will be on the application form, but it will also basically specify that the application form is one created by the township, meaning we can always add additional criteria to that application form as we go through the process and realize there's more information we would like to have. Uh, and so it, we're, we're trying to create something that is flexible going forward that we don't need to amend our ordinance to keep up with people who are looking for a loophole. And if these things become the wave of the future, we probably also want to have a caveat in there. We can set the fees by resolution. Fees by resolution is a great suggestion. <laughs> um, and, you know, as far as the designs, you know, I understand the concern about the signs. The signs are just one option. Uh, but the signs are an option that have been upheld 
by every court that has reviewed the, the case. Because, again, you have the right as a property owner to say, don't come here. Um, so, uh, again, back to the exception, we, we have to just carefully tailor this because veterans and volunteer firemen are automatically exempt by state law, except they do still have to follow our regulations. They don't have to follow our license requirements. Uh, but, in addition to that, we have, um, you know, in, in the course of reviewing these ordinances in other towns, they have an exception for delivery people. And I said, oh, okay, interesting. So if you call someone to make a scheduled delivery to your property of a good, of course they don't need to be licensed to do that. UPS, FedEx. <laughs> well, and, 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 a, a direct seller. So if you said, I'm buying a mattress, and the mattress company has its own delivery trucks, they can just come in and deliver the mattress. They don't need a license. Yes. So, but the idea is, you know, this is about health and safety of township residents. And so we want to regulate the people who are not otherwise subject to significant regulation and significant um, sort of ordinary business protections that are in place. So the mattress guy is not going to show up at your door ordinarily to try to sell you a you mattress. You're going to go to their place of business and engage with them after. So the, again, the, we're, the reason it's not on the, the agenda to be introduced tonight is we are still looking for that additional feedback. And we could have discussed this prior, you know, in closed session because there is technically a threat of litigation out there. But one of the things we also like is public feedback. feedback. Absolutely, because we know this is a sensitive issue. We want to be as transparent about it as we can be. In, in, again, in the interest of protection. Okay. But so what, I, what I've heard tonight, just to summarize, is we're looking at these being set by resolution uh, with a default in the absence of effective resolution. Uh, I actually did prepare this ordinance with uh, open hours from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Hearing the mayor's comment, it sounds like not, you know, and I'm going to tell you something you don't like, but courts have struck down the idea of sunrise to sunset, that has been determined to be not legally enforceable. But I think we could probably look at eight to eight if we're looking at just narrowing. We do need to provide an opportunity to catch people after normal working hours. Uh, so we're a little constrained by that, but if seven to nine seems a little too long, we could make it eight to eight. I think eight to eight. Or even at 5.30. <laughs> 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 yeah. That has already been reviewed by the court. I think, I think eight to eight's reasonable. I mean, and, and uh, you're not going to make everybody happy because you're going to have somebody that comes in. I'd rather have them come at. I work night shift. I'd rather have them come. You know, but there's no, you know there's no there's no good time if you're sleeping <laughs> or your kids are sleeping. Well, and again, that's where the do not knock registry comes in and the signs come in, uh, which just to be clear, the the signage. We are making specifically a requirement of our ordinance, and this is absolutely enforceable. That anyone who puts up a sign, whether it's one that we have supplied in some way or one that they obtained on their own, that is a legally enforceable notice to anyone who would otherwise want to enter the property. So whether the township ultimately makes signs available or not is beside the point because those signs are being incorporated as part of our ordinance so that if someone is, is really taking it as many measures that they can, they can put their own sign one way or the other. That would be well, we have plenty of sign vendors in the township, and I would encourage everybody to <laughs> utilize our sign and, vendors. And Mayor, again, it was only to show the seriousness of the committee and the commitment to keep people off their, your properties. Yeah. Well, and actually, just to wrap up the sign issue, the way I've drafted the most current work and draft is the township may provide signs. And that may be with a fee or without fee. So there's a lot of flexibility under the ordinance that you can later on by resolution take whatever action you deem appropriate. Okay. Oh, when since we're talking about hawking and pedaling, I had a conversation with our lifeguards. I guess uh, CL has uh, Mr. Fudgy or something that sells Fudgy ice cream on the beach. He's sneaking over. And uh, he's come into Strathmere numerous times. We, we do not, um, we don't have anything in place where we sell 
he, he would be subject to this ordinance. And there are other towns even in the county that have ordinances applicable to sales specifically of ice cream. It's one of those things that actually goes as long as three. Um, so with that said, we do have a specific requirement in the draft ordinance for anyone selling food or beverages that they would have to first obtain county health department approval, which is applicable to any other seller of food or beverages. So for example, every restaurant has to have county approval before opening. Yes. So in this case, Food trucks to get to Well, this guy's a, just a vendor walking the beach with one of those strap on cores. Understood. And, we admit um, that would apply. and I'm sure he bid the job to get it in Seattle, and it, it's just because the Second Street parking so close to Strathmere. We, we asked uh, we asked our code uh, enforcement to reach out to Seattle City's code enforcement and just put them on notice to stay on his side of the line. <laughs> so, there, and I have not. I, let's put it this way. I didn't look at that issue, but I didn't know that was an issue in the township. The rules around selling on the beach may give you a little more leeway than the door to door sales rules. So it would be the consensus of the committee that to the, extent, to the maximum extent possible, you would like to prohibit sales on the beach, or are you open to. Well, I'm, did we receive I'm, complaints, or was it just a notice that they were selling ice cream? I, I just, I got. <laughs> I can't imagine anybody was complaining yeah, yeah. about an ice cream but, but see, on the but, beach. But, but, <laughs> I like Mr. Fudge. Well, I'm not. I want something from a ten-year-old. Yeah, I'm right? not. <laughs> well, what I'm saying is, to, to, for him to get that contract in Seattle, and they gave him access to Arby's, <laughs> he bid for that contract. He's paying the city of Seattle real money. But he comes in on Strathmere, we're giving it away. Well, we don't charge anybody, though. So is it a conversation of do we prohibit it altogether or do we want to start charging people? I don't. You know. Right. Or, or, again, in the context of I'm just, right. it came up so in a... Do we want to have open season or do we want to say, you know, there's a problem... definitely don't want open season. ...to be an approved... Well, and currently, that's sort of what you have. So, so what I hear Mr. Mayor saying is... It's something we need to think we, about. We would think about whether we want to make it an exclusive contract uh, that, that would be bid for... Yeah. Well, all the municipalities sell ice cream on the beach. That's a that's a, a mercantile license and a biddable so, activity. Where the township can make some money. I mean, yeah. not that, you know, and so I'll give you... search the issue and, and get you uh, more guidance on that. Now, now how keep, are, in, keep in mind one thing. Other townships have the capability <coughs> of cleaning litter up off the beach. Oh, yes. They do that every day. And so these are things that come along with that kind beach of stuff. vendors. Yes. Wrappers and cups. Sticks. And Sticks. Um, <laughs> you, you mentioned ice cream trucks. I have a business. I bring uh, Mr. Softy's ice cream truck. He gets, I bring food trucks to my business. Would that fall under our... So uh, there is actually an exception for vendors who are present with the permission of the property owner. So to the extent that you are inviting that, and I assume this is the campground. Yes. So to the extent that you are inviting a food vendor, to the campground, it's not, it would not require licensure because, again, the whole point of this is to prevent unwanted solicitations. So to the extent that you as the owner say, I would like to have this, um, it, it is exempt. Okay. Because there's people that do the food truck weddings or food trucks in their yard for a party, so I mean... It's, it's like a private... Yeah. I, I, I'm just... Yeah. Well, it's going to come up in well, questions. Yeah, it's, 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 a care, it's a careful balancing act of covering all our bases, but leaving enough exceptions that are reasonable because, of course, for example, the grocery stores in town get regular deliveries, right? They get deliveries of food that they have ordered. We're not making the bread truck guy and the meat guy get uh, a license. That's not what this is about because they, again, are welcome. Uh, so, if, for example, I, had, I told you my process was, we, and Gary mentioned this evening, we looked at other towns' ordinances and took what was best. Well, I realized that after the segue incident, the draft ordinance that you're currently looking at says goods, wares, and merchandise. And I said, huh, what if you're selling services? Now it covers services. So if you're selling services, you're still subject to this. You can't come along and say, well, I'm in, you know, it looks like you need um, lawnmower services. You don't get to just canvas a neighborhood without licensing and making sure that the township has vetted you. Okay. All right.
Great discussion. Okay. The other, the uh, item 20 was something that uh, Deputy Mayor Newman and I are working on. Uh, we finally got the details of why there was a 125 percent increase from the different from the different uh, quotes. So mm -hmm. the street went in, and now they have to uh, redo the system for the um, the emergency beacon. And so the beacon went from 40,000 to 100,000, and now it's 60,000. And then so the municipality is still um, only 25%, um, 25%. Right? 25%, so 25,000. So um, where we left it with Deputy Mayor? Uh, what, what I, the whole thing is the state put, put in this highway, rebuilt the, the curb there, and it's all well and good. Part of that um, is uh, there, there is a safety issue there. They are on a state highway with no shoulders. It's very difficult to get in and out of that firehouse as well as, um, as, well as backing the apparatus in when you're done. They just don't have any room. It's a problem. Uh, the state, in, in my opinion and in the opinion of Tuckahoe Fire Company, did not tr treat Tuckahoe Fire, Fire Company very well uh, during the whole thing. When they reconstructed they, the road, we tried to get it. Yeah, we tried to get the beacon. They didn't want to do it then at that time, and I don't know the whole semantics of all that happening. This is an emergency beacon that allow them to put uh, to have flashing lights on the highway when the trucks are entering, similar to what we have in front of the Marmora Firehouse, and that is, but that's a county road, and that was a whole different story. It was a little bit easier to do that. That being said, they still want it. Obviously, it's gone from. You know, as Gary said, from 44000 to uh, um, uh, over $100,000, and our cost share would be uh, $25,000. Uh, we're talking to, in the meantime, we're talking to Tuckahoe Fire Company uh, with regard to them picking up some of it. Their Board of Fire Commissioners doing some of it. Um, and then also there's a continuing annual cost of the upkeep and the, work, the electricity to go to it. That being said, uh, I just think it's ridiculous that the state of New Jersey is, you know, once again, uh, our heroes. And um, I would recommend and make an informed motion that we authorize the mayor to um, uh, to, to go after, uh, not go after, excuse me, I shouldn't say that, to uh, write a letter uh, strongly objecting to this whole price increase, the cost share analysis for it. For state project, uh, and that we allow that to go to our local, our senators, and our two assemblymen uh, from from their portion. I would be willing to sign that letter. I will second would. the motion. Thank you. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 All right, I hereby move that all claims submitted for payment at this meeting be approved and incorporated in full in the minutes of the meeting. Second. Oh. oh. Uh, I'll, I'll amend my motion uh, to fall in line with uh, the CFO's uh, recommendation. Second. Please call the roll. Mr. Yes. 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 Okay. Keep going. Okay. At this time, we're going to open it to the public. If anybody in the public would like to address us, please come up to the mic, state your name, and.
I just feel that you know, there's so many complaints and trap there, and I don't want you guys to focus your attention. Well, our township's pretty diverse, guys. So I, I watched the, the uh, meeting, the, the township meeting last, the last meeting on the video, and uh, like I just, I thought, why well, I couldn't get it out of my head, you know, I mean, just couldn't get it out of my head, so the things you know, that I heard before, so, you know. um, It's hard to believe that, that a huge, huge areas of the beach are closed off for birds, but children are strapped there. Well, the Strathmere, the beach closure for the birds, that's the DEP. Yeah. And they are endangered birds. And yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we're just having a tour of the attorney bracket there, how much money they're going to make in order to intimidate the township, you know, to, to see things better. Uh, yeah, like the Jersey Shore has been, you know, through over the last couple of years, you know, residents. Strathmere is a very unique place, yes. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Gettmanis. And before I get started, I would really appreciate it if you could just uh, take my statement and not have a bunch of interruptions in between because it does kind of go wrong. <coughs> um, obviously, I'm here to speak about the 50% tax increase and the 2022 budget. In addition to the announcement of the 15% increase, some additional key points specific to this year's public energy budget. Barbara Louie stated that salaries and debt services are the two major factors driving the tax increase. Financial admin department is up $121,000, EMS is up $70,000, tax collection services is up $74,000, and code enforcement is doubled. The township increased its debt services by $80,000, and net health and group benefits over $600,000. And Mayor Corson, in that article, it said that uh, a lot of this is out of our control, and yes, Mayor, yes, prices are out of our control, but managing the budget and keeping within the means, uh, all of that stuff is within the control. That's what the administration and the county employees are hired to do. Just as I have to live within my means, so does the township. But one of those concerning points is that the township is using $1.65 million out of um, the surplus funds to cover this year's budget, we think only $146,000 in reserve. It was my understanding that reserve funds are intended to cover up not intended. 
Well, thank you, and uh, thank you. I uh, just want to say I can't answer any particular question because I think you were well over 30 questions. So uh, I will tell you, and I will ask you. To, I'm willing to set up a meeting with you if you would like to come in and meet with my administrator, and myself, and we can go over some of these things with our chief financial officer in the conference room. We could probably answer some of these questions for you. So. Is there anyone else in the public?
Have you gone out back and seen the charging station? Right. It doesn't exist. There is no charging station. It's, a, it's an exterior outlet that has been upgraded to take on additional responsibilities. Well, the, And I, well, it's an outlet. There's, there's no charging station out there. It's, it's, it's an outlet. It's, a, it's, it's misrepresenting what it is yeah. when you say charging station. It's people are envisioning this big Tesla, the, the pillar with it says Tesla. That's not what it is. That's not not in this room. You're not. I understand that, but that's not what it is. It, right. And and we also said that it was available to the public in case of emergencies. So it does have a lock, it does have a key, and you do need to contact the township if you are in an emergent situation so that we can provide that. This that is, we've, happen? we, it happened when it's, it was installed. <laughs> um, that it is available to the public for emergencies. Because it is not in a meter. Right. Have you contacted anybody? It's not a meter station. Ask, have you contacted anybody recently? About yeah. What? About about this. I'm just questioning. I'm right. Well, this isn't a town. This isn't a town hall. This isn't a town hall forum. No. This is public. This is public comment. Correct. It's not on the agenda. This is not a public. Correct. Okay. I understand that. This is not a town hall, and this is not a, a political event. I, I, didn't, I didn't have a question. I, I made a statement. Your, your political affiliations are known, and your political... All right, we're, we're, they're crystal clear. All right, we're, this is not going to be a soapbox for, for your political agenda. You, you can. It's been answered. It's been answered. This has been answered over and over again. It's been in the media. It's been on your blog. It's been answered. No, it hasn't been answered. It has been. I just did. Again. And, and we just you, you don't want to listen well, right to now it's secured it can be used for an emergency events we've, we've talked you about this, this before this is a done issue we've talked about um, this is a done issue we've talked about this before we've discussed this that's why it's not on the agenda it's an exterior receptacle yes sure and we explained it Do you, do you also recall the conversation that we had about the, the lack of meters in the township and, and the, can I finish now? Yes. And the initiatives that we've been putting forth at the planning board level to try and make sure that projects going forward provide for those types of things because we'd lack that. And you had a nice exchange with Mr. DeMarzo. I'm still speaking. I'm still speaking. You had a very nice exchange with Mr. DeMarzo where you were in full support and you talked about how Rio Grande is like the next closest charging station. So it is available to the public in case of emergencies. It is not open for anyone just to pull up and charge up. Yes, it is not a metered station. There is no meter attached to it because it's just an outlet. So there's no way to meter an outlet for public use. We can't swipe a credit card onto the box that's metered. There's no way. So until Mayor Corson's, some of his initiatives for green energy and those things move a little farther forward, we do have this available in case of emergencies. We what has changed since the last meeting? Nothing. It's locked. But it's still available for public use. You just can't. Call, you can call City Hall. The, 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 there's, we have a. The, it's an exterior receptacle. <laughs> okay. I agree. Those are tens of thousands of dollars. I don't, we think, have I don't actually, think that was an attack. We have actually investigated. We're looking at. Yes. We're. we're we're, we're, we, we do want metered charging stations in Upper Township. We do want them. Which we is have, all information we, shared we, last meeting. We have, we have bought, brought a grant writer on board. We're looking at electric vehicles for our town hall fleet. There's a whole host of things we need to do. Which was all information that was shared and during I this can, discussion I, last meeting. And I applaud <laughs> that. I totally supported that. If you listen to me and remember what I said, I applaud that. You just said it doesn't exchange with the 
Yes. Mr. Barton, this is nothing about that. It was a simple statement based on behalf of taxpayers, on the taxpayers. So am I. <laughs> so, so we're all I. taxpayers, too. <laughs> it wasn't said that last meeting that it was lost. Yeah. It was not said. I apologize for that. It was a heated exchange, and perhaps that bit of information was overlooked. But the bottom line is it is not just a general use. We did discuss that it is an emergent use, that there has to be something available, because, as you so clearly pointed out, there is nothing in this area. And we have several other initiatives. We are looking into grant funding to put charging stations in different areas throughout the township. We are look, working with the planning board to be able to make sure that large-scale commercial projects coming into the township must provide these type of charging stations, all of which should be no cost to the taxpayer. Correct? Well, a great way to resolve this would be to give our township engineer direction to contact one of the providers of vehicle charging stations and ask them to put a metered station out there using our outlet and then they could in turn uh, reimburse the township for any electricity use. And that is also so conversations we, that we've had. Right, we've had so that conversation. I'll make that in the form of a motion. Well, we're, we're right now, John, this is public engineer. comment. This right, is, this right, is right, right now, John, we're in the process of finding grant money to, to build these stations. Yes. Which you've been part of those conversations, John, you know that. You've, that's, you've, that's you've been all exactly included in those conversations that you know that's moving forward. Honestly, I just, I agree that we should have organizations. I like to love the fact we have charging stations. All I said was, I agree with Mr. Barton that there's nothing in the record I'm sorry you feel that way. Yes. Yes. All right. I, I do remember that. And I also remember you telling my family and friends to call the prosecutor's office because you thought we were criminal. I remember that as well. So it go you threatened us. I would appreciate a private conversation on a lot of these right. topics. So, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you feel right. that way. More. Well, we want people to speak, and we thank you for your comments. We thank you for your comments, Barbara. I, 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 thank you. Know. Is there anyone else? Yes. Hi. I'm Joe Falls. Hi, John. Uh, we've had uh, some discussion. It's been moved to the planning board. Planning boards put a subcommittee together, which Kim and I are both on. We've had a lot of discussion. We had another planning board meeting Thursday night. We're meeting again. Our subcommittee is meeting Wednesday. Wednesday night. Wednesday night. So subcommittee's not open to the public. There's a whole bullet point list. We dove into it a little bit, and we're back to we're working on it. Some of your members were at that planning board meeting. No, they were no, they were they weren't at the subcommittee. They were at the regular the planning board. Meeting. Had a very productive uh, conversation. Yes, about it. they saw the process, and it's it's uh, it's in process. Excellent. Thank you very much. There's also one other thing I, I did notice um, with eight years of being here, um, with the traffic study that was done, um, there's been a lot of people that have been involved in the process. I was just curious if there's any way with the traffic study we could make um, the traffic going east on Roosevelt Boulevard second or third to our turning lane. Because when they go, when they have the second right away, I guess we'll call it second right away. The first one will be in front of the guns, the second one will be going to the city, and then us. Does that make sense? Yeah. Not, not really, but if you can do me a favor, because I do talk to the county almost daily, okay. give me that in an email. 
relative to the length of the traffic signals? Actually, and Jay's where you familiar with I'm very familiar with that. Are I you? deal with that every it's, single day. Yeah, it's more so it's not the length of the traffic, it's the traffic light. It's once we do get the green, um, we can't go because the traffic. I understand. I don't understand, but if, if you can get, if you can memorialize that for me, I'll pass it along. Yeah, you're, you're better off going to Wild Wild Turn and running coming back. <laughs> uh, not, not necessarily, not necessarily, because I think it's a a symptom of just a huge volume of traffic that backs up virtually every um, uh, every weekend uh, between probably ten thirty and one o'clock. Okay. But if you notice what I'm saying is, yeah. um, if the turning lane was first before. Yeah, but the people that come that are going east that are going straight, uh, yeah, I, I get it. And the, plus, the Dunkin' Donuts is a problem too, because that traffic sometimes spills out. out of the parking lot. It's gotten a lot less lately because my wife stopped drinking Dunkin' Donuts. So, <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's definitely um, definitely backs up into onto Route Nine. It is it is a hazard, and I, I really don't. No, the timing of the of the lights is pretty well timed there. Don't know what can be done, but uh, we can obviously uh, go with the camera. I'll a better on the paper. If you yeah. could, yeah. and then uh, and, 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 and and you know, and other municipalities can post an officer and a uniformed officer in a car and move that traffic. Yeah. The, again, you know, you. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I'll I understand. I understand. Yeah. I appreciate you guys all. And Joe, the, the, the house that was in question on Bayer is, uh, from what I understand, is it's starting September. It's going to be a, a yearly round, okay. which that's a good thing. But there's still gotta we still got to address this because I heard there's two more in the works in the more more area for Airbnbs. This will be addressed. It's not, uh, in, it has to be. It has to be. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes. Is there anyone else from the public? Okay, hearing no more public, uh, we'll entertain a motion to go into closed session. Uh, prior to my motion going into closed session, I'd like to make a motion that the uh, township engineer be directed to solicit bids from providers of electric charging stations that we could hook in here to our outlet at Township Hall. That way this meter situation could be resolved and perhaps the township could gain a little bit of additional income. In addition to that, I'd like to make sure that the township engineer gets back to us at the 926 meeting with his report on uh, where we are in that process. And I'd just like to add, just be careful what you create off that outlet. That outlet is not substantially a, had the ability to do what you're asking it to do. So it's, it's, the engineer and I are both in the grant writing process for flow for that type of station. So you're creating a hazard by what you're trying to implement in that outlet. But from what so I understand, it's a, a 35 amp outlet that will not support, uh, or a 50 amp outlet, it will not support one of the quick charging stations. Am I right? Yes. I think, well, John's got a motion on for I think what we're, I don't want to see is pay for something, John, that we're trying to get grant money for, so. I can understand that, but if that's the case, then if we do not have that outlet meter, I request that it be locked off permanently for, uh, for all users. Well, that's a good idea either. Yeah, to sit there and limit it to, to no use at all is, is not a good idea. Seeing no second, I don't think that motion. No, it's not going anywhere. I just think it's a. Uh, I think what we're saying it was a it was a noted public health and safety issue and we provided it for emergency use. And anything else? I said so at this okay. point that's what the outlet is yep. at this point. Yeah. 
Mr. Gordon. So we need so then how would we direct the public to use that in the event of an emergency? What are we going to do? Are we going to put instructions on the website? Are we going to put a sign that directs them that they can stop into town hall and plug their vehicle into it? Yes. We're going to develop a policy a standard that, that needs to get access to that particular outlet. I was actually asking the committee, but thanks for your input. Oh, I thought you were asking me because you're looking at me. No, I wasn't. I was oh, I didn't know. Hey, here. listen, I'll, I'll, just, I'll sit here. Go ahead. That policy is already in the works as, as to how, uh, you know, people who have access to after hours, um, you know, for facilities, there's after hours contact numbers, that kind of thing, but we don't want to over, overburden um, the township employees by having random members of the public. There's been some conversation about um, state police have ways to contact the administrator, um, you know, in case of an emergency with something in the township. There's so. Well, we have the EMS so that, building is monitored that it's occupied. That's a good. Seven. That's a good suggestion. So not not guaranteed, John. That's a, it's, it's, it could be out in call. Well, unless there's three of them on a call at one time, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> but that's but that's a very good suggestion. Thank you, John. All right. I hereby move that the resolution be incorporated into the minutes authorizing the township committee to enter into the executive session for the following matters pursuant to the order of the public meetings act. The matters are the personnel, potential litigation due will in alleged violations, contract negotiation for the following, special legal counsel, EMS building, and OEM. I also include my motion the estimated time and circumstances under which the discussion conducted in closed session can be disclosed to the public as follows. It is anticipated that the matters discussed in closed session may be disclosed to the public upon the determination of the Township Committee that the public interest will no longer be served by such confidentiality. With respect to employment and personnel matters, such discussions will be made public if more formal action is taken or when the individuals involved consent that it can be made public. With respect to contract negotiations, such matters will be, will be made public when negotiations have ceased and there is no longer a reason for confidentiality. Second. Please call the roll. Mr. Powell? Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Mr. 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 Yes. Mr.